Hi, and welcome to Bourbon Turntable. We're a show where we blend the love of music with the love of whiskey. My name is Kevin Rose, and I've got with me Benjamin Eves. Ben, how you doing tonight? Hey, doing great. How are you doing, Kevin? Very good. Happy belated birthday. Thank you, sir. Looks like you uh, had a, a, a good celebration this weekend. I did. I did. Got to uh, catch a live show that turned out to be absolutely spectacular. So, And that was all like on that day, spontaneous, you know, didn't plan it, didn't get tickets till we were like hours out from the show. Yeah. Hey, let's go. Saw this is happening. Let's go do this. That's awesome. So it turned out to be great. Love it. Love it. Drew Crawley, how are you, sir? Good evening. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing well. Doing well. I uh, appreciate you guys and looking forward to tonight's show. It should be a lot of fun. We will be talking about the Highwaymen. And if you don't know who the Highwaymen, highwaymen are, you are in for a treat. And if you do, you know you're in for a treat also. This is going to be fun to talk about this. But before we get to that, uh, Drew has supplied uh, Benji and myself with a blind sample. So, Drew, we will turn it over to you, sir. <clears throat> So, Drew, we'll turn it over to you for the blind sample. All right. Well, I would love to uh, to get you guys' thoughts. Do you want the reveal first, or do you want to talk through it first? I'm good either way. No, we can talk through it first. All right. I just want to see what you guys think. Okay. I, uh, I'm i still on my sober kick for another couple of days, but I've had this one enough, so I, I think I'd be able to recall. Kind of, the nose kind of makes me think it's uh, something finished. I don't know how much you want me to go into it, but you're on the right track. Okay. Tried to throw a little bit of a curveball. Okay. How much of a curveball? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty big curveball. Jobu can't hit curveball. <laughs> yeah. it, it is uh, American. I'll, I'll say Okay. That. Okay. I know both of you have a, a palette, you know, that is, you know, lit up by some of the craft and some of the experimental stuff. So I tried to stay in that vein a little bit, but give you something you might not uh, do a whole lot of. So what it, what else you guys get on the nose? <clears throat> I just took a sip. And I'll get back to the nose in a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what, what about the palate? We can talk about that too. No, 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 no. We're good. Here's the thing for me on the nose. I'm having a, I'm getting a lot of a, like a strong ethanol burn coming off of this. I'm mm -hmm. having a hard time getting through that into what's there. I can tell there is a finish going on. It's a, got a little bit of a funk to it. Mm -hmm. What do you pick up on the palate, Ben? And it's really sweet at first. Mm -hmm. There's a good, strong tannic pull. And that proof has got some real peppery kick to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if, if I'm getting... It's a little bit creamy. I don't know if I'm getting the proof or the... Or if it's the uh, uh, spiciness, but it, it seems like it's a higher proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. This feels uh, this definitely feels up there. Well, I'll uh, I'll share what it is here so that we uh, you guys don't have a, a full on buzz going into our <laughs> of the show. But uh, any other thoughts about you know palate or, or nose on this before I tell you about it? It is, um, <clears throat> it's got some great legs to it. You can't mm -hmm. see that on here, but yeah, um, very oil, so very oily and um, really clings to the tongue in a really good way. Um, the finish goes on for a while. Yeah, there's something wow. funny I'm trying to nail down here on the palate. 
That's interesting. Like I've tasted this before. What is mm -hmm. this? Yeah, um, I get a ton of like the dark, um, almost like a rum raisin type thing, like a yeah. dried dark uh, so fruit. Dark fruit, and you said rum, and that's where I was almost. If I'm thinking finish, I'm almost leaning towards a rum finish on it. I could be way off on this, but it comes. Like, there's there's some notes here that remind me of like a that made me think maybe this could be a rum finish. I don't know. Yeah. But all right, well, I'll uh, I'll pull back the blinders uh, on it. So this is the 2021 Barrel Dovetail release. So oh, this is a okay. bourbon mash bill, uh, but it's finished in rum, uh, mm -hmm. port, and cab barrels. So okay. quadruple or triple finished uh, outside yeah. of the <clears throat> primary aging. Uh, it's 124.7 proof. So a lot, a lot of proof on this one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, you know, was really skeptical and iffy on barrel with a lot of their mm -hmm. early releases only because of that price point, you yeah. know, 80 to $90 for a standard release. And then, you know, everything else, mm -hmm. uh, goes up from there, but I have loved this release the last couple of years. They always do something different. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm kind of got my eyes out for those when I see them. Uh, whenever they have a new dovetail project and thought you guys would enjoy just something a little different, a little bit uh, of a crazy finish. I do like that. They did not choose to call it bourbon uh, right. because even though it meets the criteria as far as mash bill, um, you know, it does go through some secondary aging <clears> enough <throat> so that you can definitely say that it adds both color and flavor. Um, right. So I like that they kind of respect those right. legal definitions as opposed to some of the other ones that we've discussed on previous shows. Um, you know, things like the Angels MB and the Jack Daniels and all those other things that are kind of disputed. So um, I really like it. I think it opens up a lot with a splash of water. Okay. Um, so I usually put a little bit in um, a rocks glass <clears throat> or something if I'm drinking this one. Um, this is definitely a sit down and watch Netflix pour. This is not just a, you know, this is a, this is a slow roller for me. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like this one would, this one would really benefit some time in the glass, just letting it evolve, watching it evolve as you work through it. Mm -hmm. And I really like it. I've liked a lot of the stuff I've had from barrel dovetail yeah. being one of them. So yeah, pretty cool. No, oh, I agree cool. with you on, on uh barrel. Uh, I really had a problem with it at, at, at first. Um, I thought, okay, you got, you're, you're buying up source whiskey and, charging an arm and a leg for it um but when you get when you dig into it and you see the way they're blending everything mm -hmm. um uh, i've got a lot of respect for that because they yeah. do a really good job with it right um it is not simply a matter of let's go buy nine-year dickel and throw it in a bottle and put our label on it and, and right. charge you 140 dollars for it right um so I, I've I've enjoyed uh, a number of the the things they've put out, and this is very good. Yeah, uh, I don't know that I've had the 2021 yet, um, but and and what were the the different barrels that you said it was aged in? It was, uh, well, I, and I did some research on this. I couldn't get anything solidly confirmed, but uh, I believe it's Jamaican rum, yeah. um, and then there's a port wine, and then it's specifically from the Dunn Vineyard. Um, okay. in okay. California, uh, mm -hmm. the Cabernet barrel. <clears throat> okay. So three different finishes from what I understand, they did three separate batches and did some finish in rum, some finish in port, some finish in cab barrels, mm -hmm. and then blended at the end rather than aging, right. you know, each okay. batch, uh, or each, each barrel, you know, three different sure. times, but it's, you've got to respect, I think on a certain level of the skill and the artistry that it takes to do a blend of that kind and have so Absolutely. much going on flavor. I don't necessarily think it um, it came out unbalanced. I think it, it really does. One of the things that reasons it's hard to pick up on any specific note is just because of how kind of balanced each individual yeah. component tends to be. Yeah. The more I get into it, the more I feel like the rum stands out a little bit. But you that rum gets uh, kind of boosted by that the little bit of funk coming from the port. Mm -hmm. And then you get that red wine coming in there, the tannins. I think that that pulled from that, and it's yeah, no, it's well well done. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this uh, one. Glad I'm you guys like. I'm gonna enjoy sitting with this one later on. Yeah. yeah, it the it starts sweet, and then it gets a little 
bitter at the end. And I don't know if it's the 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 tannins from the barrel or if it's something in in the whiskey itself. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's in the whiskey itself now. Right. Um, but it's very interesting. Um, and I, I would agree, uh, really well balanced. So that's fun. Love it. Yep. Love cool. It. Thanks, Drew. Wines are always a good time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'll look forward to, to doing a few more of those. Uh, but we are uh, wrapping up uh, side A of the show. We're getting ready to flip it over to side B, where we will talk about the highwaymen. But the uh, first thing we want to do before we do that is we want to tell you about an upcoming show that we've got with uh, Jack and Tim from the show Monday Suck. Now, if you've not seen their show, uh, you should. If you can't uh, guess from the title, it's on Mondays. Um, <laughs> and it makes Mondays suck a little bit less. <laughs> they, uh, they are on at 9 o'clock on Instagram. And we will be recording a show with them here in a couple weeks. It will air on uh, November 17th. Uh, Jack, uh, if you don't know him by Jack, you would know him by the... Uh, his uh, nickname, his moniker, the Hood Sommelier. And uh, he and Tim have been doing the show together, I guess, for uh, maybe about a year. And uh, a couple of really good guys. Uh, it will be interesting to talk whiskey with them and talk music with them because they both come from uh, very different musical backgrounds as well. So this will be a lot of fun. So uh, mark your calendars uh, for November 17th. Uh, will be the date that that show drops and it will be bourbon turntable uh, meets Monday suck. So that will be a lot of fun. All right. So we're to side B now and Drew is going to tell us a little bit about the highwayman. All right. So for those of you guys not familiar uh, with the highwayman, it was a super group uh, came out in the mid eighties uh, and was active through the mid nineties. Uh, composed of four of, if not four, uh, uh, the four uh, greatest country and Western singer-songwriters. Um, so you've got uh, Mr. Chris Christopherson, one of the finest songwriters of uh, the late 20th century. You've got the man in black, uh, Mr. Johnny Cash, uh, the outlaw country king, Waylon Jennings, and then uh, Mr. Redheaded Stranger or Shotgun Willie or the ambassador to Weedville, uh, Mr. <laughs> Willie Nelson. So, uh, absolutely fantastic group gave us three incredible, um, studio albums, uh, mostly of original compositions and a few very great covers. Uh, got some fantastic live albums, some great stuff out there. Uh, I just recently came back from the country music hall of fame and, uh, their, you know, little section on the highwaymen was fantastic. Uh, they dedicated mm -hmm. a good portion of the second floor. Uh, to those guys right now it's, it's pretty cool so incredible super group incredible legacy i'm really excited to get to talk about them tonight yeah, well uh in, in terms of super groups of uh all time they may be the may be the super group of super groups mm -hmm. I, I can't i would have a hard time coming up with uh, another group that, that rivals that, maybe the Traveling Wilburys, um, but uh, the Highwaymen is something special. Um, yep. Ben, any thoughts? Um, I'm, I mean, I'm a freaking huge fan. Uh, Outlaw Country and older style, that, that was my bread and butter growing up in a lot of music circles, and good Lord, I have so many memories to their albums, to their songs. Um, when I was, I don't know, fresh out of high school, or early college, we used to have poker nights with uh, mm -hmm. friends of mine, Friday and Saturday nights. And that consisted of typically a bottle of Old Crow, a lot of cheap beer. Um, <laughs> we had, uh, what was, uh, shoot, the, uh, the Maverick was on the TV, mm -hmm. just playing <laughs> that movie. Sound off, but the movie was on just to provide some background and typically it was going to be the highway men or either some live way Waylon Jennings albums was typically what was mm -hmm. spinning music wise. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, a lot of great memories that, and not just that, but so many more. I, I'm a huge fan of all four of those guys at, individually. Mm -hmm. And then just as a band, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't even know where to begin because it's just, 
to me they're that freaking good and their songs are just amazing so yeah mm -hmm. well let's let's begin by talking about the song uh from which they took their name uh the highwayman um uh, that was um a song that was written by um well now i've lost lost my thought on it jimmy webb i believe it was jimmy mm -hmm. webb and um he wrote the song i think glenn campbell recorded it at one point and then these guys got a hold of it and uh the song is about reincarnation and uh johnny cash didn't realize that until sometime later when his daughter explained it to him um <laughs> but sounds about uh, right each each of the guys uh sings a verse and each verse is about a different character that this individual uh is reincarnated as uh the first one is uh the high woman uh who is uh willie and then there's a sailor which is chris then there's uh a dam builder building the, the hoover dam and that's waylon and then yep. johnny cash is the astronaut <laughs> so um that that was the basis for the song and uh, it was a number one hit for these guys uh mm -hmm. and they loved the song so much that that's what they called themselves the highwaymen pretty great origin story there i love that uh the the highwaymen as a group i mean all the all these guys have, have knew each other for a long time and yeah. uh you know uh, chris christopherson uh while pretty close in age to Johnny Cash, uh, was his career started a lot later. Uh, and he had moved to Nashville because he wanted to be close to where Johnny Cash was and was writing songs and trying to break through. And he flew a helicopter onto Johnny Cash's yard to try to get his attention to see if he would record one of his songs. Uh, so that was the, the first time that uh, Christopherson and Cash uh, had any kind of interaction. I don't know if, uh, if, if Johnny uh, was home that day or not, uh, but uh, Chris Christopherson said later, the song that I was trying to get him to record was terrible, but I just wanted him to, re to I wanted to try to get his attention somehow. And ultimately, mm -hmm. Johnny Cash recorded some of Christopherson's songs. And, a lot of them, uh, yeah. They yeah. became uh, great friends. Uh, but the High Women as a group got together uh, to record Johnny Cash's Christmas special <clears throat> in 1984. And they got along so great that they decided they would record an album together. And that got us the first High Women album. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, when you look at that first album, any any thoughts on that? What stands out there? I was just going back through and reading the track list, and then realizing, I mean, just how many absolutely fantastic songs are on there. Yeah. Um, they've got you know a Bob Seger cover, uh, yep. that song "Against the Wind." We all love that one. Uh, they've got a John Prine tune yep. on yep. there, um, and then. Uh, I've always I always loved that song Desperados Waiting for a Train. I remember yeah, yeah. riding around in my grandfather's pickup uh, in Kansas growing up and having that song be on, uh, and him kind of explaining who those guys were to me at like you know eight nine ten years old something like that. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic record. Um, Chris Christopherson's got some songs on there. Willie's got one, um, and uh, I we'll we'll get into this more in depth, but each album has a very strategic feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that goes back to the producers that they chose to work with. Um, you can hear the influence. The guy that produced the highwayman is a, a guy named chips Moman, mm -hmm. uh, but he had worked with so many gospel um, and then some country artists as well, but everybody from Al green and Aretha Franklin, um, mm -hmm. you know, to Elvis, Elvis Presley. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Um, and uh, he actually co-wrote, um, always on my mind uh mm -hmm. the one that willie would later make famous so these guys are running in some pretty uh rarefied air 
from the jump with that producer choice and then all those songs. I mean, gosh, you couldn't put a better lineup of writers in a room to come up with a record if you ask me. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the uh, differences between the three albums. Any any thoughts on that? What made those different? Because mm. Moman was producer on the first two. First two, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you can definitely tell that the second album was going into the 90s a little bit uh, more. It's less <laughs> outlaw. Um, we're not quite in the era of, you know, Garth Brooks and George Strait just yet. This still is a Tennessee country sound more than it is a Texas country mm -hmm. sound. Uh, but you're starting to see, you know, uh, both Willie and Waylon both spent a lot of time in Austin, Texas. Um late 70s, early 80s, mm -hmm. um, yep. and you can kind of hear some of those influences start to come mm -hmm. in, I think, specifically on that second album, that you're getting some more of the, the Texas country sound than you are the straight-up Nashville, um, you know, mm -hmm. RCA studio, top 40 country kind of sound that was a little bit more part of that first record. Yeah. Ben, any thoughts on that? I'm just going back, well... Going back to the first album, I mean, the songs for me are huge. And and again, I think uh, Drew just made it incredible. You look at the list of songwriters mm -hmm. they have there, and it's just, I mean, even like Guy Clark, Woody Guthrie, mm -hmm. uh, just amazing. But Highway Man was a huge hit. For me, Desperado's Waiting for a Train is probably my personal favorite because, mm -hmm. Drew, again, you hit on, you know, riding with your, riding with your grandfather in a pickup truck. I mean, that was, for me, right – it brings back so many memories of me with my own grandfather uh, mm -hmm. times I spent with him. So that, that there's just a big emotional component for that song. Yeah. Um, the last cowboy song I love Jim, I wore a tie today. That, <laughs> that is a great, so my friends and I used to sing that together all the time. Uh, we love that song. Just the, the humor in that one. Um, uh, welfare line committed to park view. That's a fun one from cash. Yeah. Um, so just good grief, great album. But yeah, I, I agree. You can see that transition exactly like what Drew's talking about going to the second album as well, musically. Yeah. So I thought the first album, as I went back through and, and listened to it again uh, this past week, uh, it had a bit of a dire, st dire straits feel to me. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of the mood of it. Uh, and the dire straits were pretty popular at that point moment uh, so i don't know if if there was if that was just kind of the wave that that music was taking at that point and given the, the guitar uh heavy songs that that are on this album if that that was just kind of a natural emergence but uh i think if you've when if you go back and you listen to that that first highwayman album uh, i think that you'll you'll hear that it's it is it's still old school country in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but it's adopting some of that, that current sound that was, that mm -hmm. was popular at that time. Not, you know, Phil Collins, the studio popular. Okay. But, <laughs> but, uh, music that, that it, it, it kind of in, incorporated some of the, the more modern sounds to it while still being mm -hmm. true to their classic, old school country roots but i mean these guys were not we think of these guys as being old because uh you know in the what we've seen from the last several years they they, they have been other than you know we we've lost uh johnny and and waylon um but at the time they were late 40s early 50s mm -hmm. so right i think country music was trying to usher them out in some ways. And this was a bit of a revival uh, yeah. uh, for at least a couple of the guys. Yeah. I think too, you got to think about musically, these guys, <clears throat> you tend to think of them as, okay, yeah, this is old school, classic country, but are they? Cause that's to me, it's, it's part of that. It's the whole outlaw genre. I think we tend to classify or tend to group people. Well, they wrote music going back, you know, however many years ago and so that's old school country but they were they were rebels each one of them musically was rebels in their own right you sure. know christopherson mm -hmm. may be a little bit more closer to the 
the classic country, but not really. All of them had their own sound. They kind of bucked the system a little bit. They were innovators. Um, and so I think each of them helped to kind of turn country music at various times in different mm -hmm. directions. And so yeah. hearing that you have a little bit of a different sound, it, to me, it, it's not so much, oh, does it buck the trend with these guys? Or no, this actually is them doing exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of chart their own path a little bit mm -hmm. with Absolutely. it. And that's, yeah. Yeah. You got to think about what's on country radio at the time. I mean, we are mm -hmm. right around the time of uh, this would be like Randy Travis. George Strait was just starting to come mm -hmm. along. Garth yep. Brooks, his first record was what? 88, 89, maybe no, it was the early nineties. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere right. At, yeah. I, but this is yeah, Martin and McBride. Um, you got this whole kind of era of a giant, you know, songwriting uh, publication house, um, a bunch of paid writers, and then the country superstars and the people on the radio were folks that were writing songs that they didn't primarily mm -hmm. author. Um, right. This is the beginning of, you know, do you want publishing rights uh, or do you want to own your masters? This is kind of the first time mm -hmm. that started this to happen is... in country music too. And then yep. you got these guys who are all fine songwriters in their own right. Um, Christofferson probably being foremost of those, I would think. Um, but they go and they write a lot of their own music. They cover mm -hmm. uh, choices are very specific and they take songs from other writers that write at the level that they do. Um, and that was not really what was popular in the country music scene at the time. Maybe, right. you know, more so at, with the 85 <laughs> album, but definitely by 90 and the 95 albums, mm -hmm. that was very countercultural, kind of to use the word that you used, Ben, mm -hmm. um, yeah. for what was going on. And I don't think you get to do that if you're just, you know, Joe Schmo walking off the street. It had to be these right. four um, with the legacy that they had already made for themselves as individuals right. to get away with that, to get right. the audience for it. I just pulled up, you you know, what, what what were the top 100 country songs in 1985? And you've got Kenny Rogers, Ronnie Millsap. That's, I was Jane about to Taylor, say, you go back to 85 and it's Kenny Rogers, it's Dolly Parton, it's Charlie Daniels. Alabama, Vassal the Juds. The Juds, yep. yep. Oak Ridge Big Boys, time. Lee Greenwood, Lee Greenwood, Oak Ridge Boys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you go back, you go to 1990, and uh, you know, George Strait had his, I think, one of his first big albums in 87. Um, and so you're starting to see a shift in, in the sound and country music. Um, mm -hmm. you're still seeing the same. I mean, the judges were just like that was every year they were winning every freaking award at the country mm -hmm. music awards. Um, but yeah, you're starting to see, yeah, Randy Travis is now. Uh, made a big name for himself. Uh, Garth Brooks is just starting to bust on the scene. Yeah. Uh, Clint Black may have been out around that same when, time. When you I get think, to 90. first albums. Yeah. Yeah. When you get to 90, it's Alabama, a whole lot of Garth Brooks. Yep. A whole lot of Clint Black, a uh, whole lot of George Strait. There's I mean, guys like Doug Stone um, that were making some big hits. Uh, I post, I shared an album uh, today, Rodney Crowell. Uh, that guy was yeah. cranking out some hits around that time. Um, you might have started to see some of those bands like Diamond Rio, and uh, I don't know, this may have been a little bit before Diamond Rio, right around that time, though. Some of these guys are starting to come on, so you're, you're seeing you're starting to see a real shift in country music at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and then, then you get to the, the third album, which is mm -hmm. uh, The Road Goes On Forever. And yep. we have a producer change. Yeah. This one's and fascinating. I, I was hoping that we yeah. would get uh, some sort of uh, deep track bootleg version of Johnny Cash singing Walk the Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been great. The producer for the third album was Don Was. Don uh, Was. Yeah. Was, not Was. Um, who, again, you know, we talked about Rick Rubin uh, recently. You know, you go back through uh, the list, his discography of who he has produced, and it's a pretty impressive list. Right. And yep. the the fact that 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 he produced an album with the Highwaymen is is pretty uh, pretty special. Yeah, that's well, a guy that I think in our conversation about you know potential great producers, mm -hmm. he's somebody that gets. 
I think conversations gets glossed over and forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then you start to look at his credentials and you're going hot dang. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Well, he's a bona fide country music producer. I mean, he, yeah. he worked with, you know, Bonnie Raitt and the stones and, you know, mm -hmm. all the other, you know, folks. Um, but he's also a, a bona fide rock and roll producer as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, with some of those names. And I think you hear that just a little bit. I, I was just listening through some of the highwaymen stuff, you know, yesterday and today. And, the prominence of pedal steel on the mm -hmm. first two records shows up a lot as the lead instrument or the lead melody <clears throat> instrument. Mm -hmm. And this third record is a lot, a lot of electric guitar. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's really shifted. And I think that rock influence uh, comes through a little bit, probably I would imagine from some of the production choices. Mm -hmm. Between the three, is there, is there a preference? nostalgically i'm partial to the third album um mm -hmm. it came out the year i was born and it was always around especially when i would go visit you know, my dad's family in kansas they're all big right. country music uh folks as i mentioned i tend to gravitate more towards that one but i like them all i mean there's killer tracks on each individual one yeah i'm i'm a fan of all three for me, nostalgia wise, I go to the first album. Like if I'm typically I'm looking to listen to Highwaymen, I'm pulling up the first album. And then there's some of the songs on uh, the second album that feel like a, a little bit of a continuation or a part mm -hmm. two of the first album. So I tend to gravitate towards those two most. And then occasionally I kick in the third album. I don't, it just, it's great. I love it, but it, it does not have the same pull for me as the first mm -hmm. two, but especially the first one. Yeah. I, it, it to me it's tough tough to make that call. Yeah. Um, there I think the the songs there are some some of the best songs are off that first album. I think the second album may have uh, be a little maybe a little deeper if that makes mm -hmm. sense in terms mm -hmm. of the the songs. Um, maybe not as good as the best songs on the first, but you know, top to bottom, you know, I, I think it's a pretty strong lineup. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the the third album. I, I kind of like the sound of that one a little bit better. Um, so I, to me, it, it's there. There are elements of each that are that are more appealing. But sure. uh, I think they're all fantastic. But but to me, the one that is the standout from the Highway. Yep. Is this American Outlaws album? Holy mm. crap! To have seen <laughs> these guys live, man, that would have been that would have been the end right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could yeah, you I think at, you'd still smell like weed smoke. If you were <laughs> <in that. laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> oh man! Uh, but the the live album, and 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 if you watch the videos of it these guys just push each other you know nobody looks like they're they're one bit under one bit of stress the whole time but you can tell that they drive the energy of one another uh mm -hmm. and you know to see them sing some of their their solo songs to see them sing some of their solo songs together you know right uh either singing yeah. harmonies or maybe trading off verses even uh and then switch into uh songs from the highwayman albums or switch into a, a, a cover uh song that's not on any of the albums it's yep. it's fantastic and the band they've got behind them is just stellar they're spot on yeah i'll never forget hearing help me make it through the night off of that uh performance for the first time i mean it's i've always loved that song but hearing yeah. them do it together was special if i'm not mistaken don was was their bass player uh for that tour as well oh i don't know that that that, that would be very cool that would be yeah. interesting yeah yeah um, that's a great yeah, no that's like that is just incredible you sit there and you just look song after song <clears throat> Yeah, on that live album. I mean, again, you're not just hearing here's Highwaymen songs. No, it's 
you've got four of some of the greatest singer songwriters and musicians in all of country music, let alone music history. Yeah. And they're pulling from their repertoire and all playing together. Right. It is, it is that's, literally that's all, just, the, all that's the Holy hits. grail. Yeah. That's like Holy grail type stuff, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where was that recorded? Do you all know off the top of it? That's all. Yep. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and, and to hear them tell it and to hear their, their kids tell it and everybody involved, these guys loved each other. They were great yeah. friends, uh, even before, uh, mm-hmm. but once this started, they were incredibly good friends, but they're also very competitive <laughs> with each other and they would fuss and fight and argue and, uh, want to make sure that they got as much spotlight as the other three, if not maybe right. just a little bit more. Uh, but they were, they were great friends and loved uh, doing these records and loved touring together. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's just a phenomenal thing that this happened. Absolutely. Well, I love too, that you can tell how much of a family thing it was so, because every year at Farm Aid, you know, mm-hmm. Shooter Jennings is around uh mm. lucas nelson will play us at john carter cash i mean they're all there right uh right. doing stuff with each other you know that next generation of those mm-hmm. guys families is still very close um uh, i love watching that unfold that's pretty neat yeah yeah there's a pbs documentary on them as well which is pretty interesting so have you guys gotten to see what's that say it again ben i'll say have you guys gotten to see any of the any of these uh individuals live I've seen Willie. <clears throat> I don't think so. No. Have you? No. I've seen, got to see Willie. Uh, had the chance to see Waylon and did not get to go, but I got, I've been able to see Willie once. Just yeah. wish I could have seen the other, seen Cash. Yeah. But yeah. Willie, even in his older age, was a fantastic show. <laughs> it's been, I mean, it's yeah. been probably. 15, 20, well, no, more than that. It's been close to 20 years ago that I saw Willie live, but even then it was, yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah. How old is Willie now? 80? Oh, God. He's up there. Yeah. Up there. He's got to be What year was he born? I want... Willie Nelson was born in 1933. He is 88. Wow. Yeah. Dad, yeah. Son. Yeah. Did you see him at uh, get to hear any of his set at Farm Aid this last year when they did the broadcast one? No, no. His his voice has lost a little bit. Just I, I just don't think he has quite the range. <clears throat> but the man can still play that guitar. Yeah, um, it's just a thing of beauty. I mean, he was up there with his sons and yeah. uh, Margot uh, Price uh, was in his band too. I mean, he just put on. A hell of an hour. I mean, they yeah. closed the night with him. Um, yeah. and it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about their kids. I mean, Lucas Nelson, uh, he's got an album out this year called A Few Stars Apart, which is fantastic. Yep. I love it. Produced by Rick Rubin, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I don't know. I'm 90% thought... sure on that. Okay. I thought it was Dave Cobb, but... It might be. I, I know he's I worked know. with Ruben previously. Yeah. I thought that he had stuck with it. But either way, if you've yeah. got to flip a coin between Whichever. those two, you're going to be yeah. just fine. But great, great album. Uh, yeah. Which I love may, that record. May, may get a mention when we do our albums of the year. Who knows? Maybe. Um, and Shooter Jennings is off, obviously uh, incredibly talented and has put out some fantastic music uh, yep. himself. Yep. So yep. I, I had the chance to meet him a few weeks ago and just – one of the kindest, you know, no ego type yeah. people that I've ever gotten to meet. I mean, he, we were at the a thing in Nashville. He just walked into the back where some of us were sitting, sat down, made sure to shake everybody's hand and introduce it. Like we didn't all know who he was, <laughs> <laughs> but a uh, very, very kind guy too. And I, you know, for as hard of living as some of those guys did, mm-hmm. uh, it's amazing to see <laughs> how gentle some of their offspring have turned out to be. I mean, <laughs> Lucas Nelson writes songs like there. I mean, it's like lullabies to his kids on half his record. So, right. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. 
All right. Well, anything else on the highwayman? I, I did want to mention there is another chapter of the legacy of these guys um, mm. that put out a record in 2019, the group, the high women. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have listened to their stuff at all, but it's another country super group. So mm. you've got Brandy Carlisle, who I, in my opinion, for my ear is one of the best songwriters in country music right now. Mm. Uh, you've got Amanda Shires, who's got some solo stuff out, but she's married to Jason Isbell. The hell of a fiddle player, great songwriter. Mm -hmm. uh, you got Natalie Hemby, who has written for you know she's written with Dolly, um, she's written with Casey Musgrave, she's written with everybody, mm -hmm. um, and then you got Marin Morris. Mm -hmm. um, all four of those ladies can write a hell of a song. Marin Morris and Natalie Hemby are have both written for a ton of people, uh, but they carry on the legacy of really, really well written songs. Um, their stuff is produced by Dave Cobb. So they've mm -hmm. got great producing. Um, and then, you know, they have performed um, some pretty incredible shows as well. The time that I got to see them live is probably about 45 minutes into the set. Uh, I think this was in October or February. Uh, one or the other. It was a couple years, a couple months before or after Christmas. 45 minutes into the set, and everything just goes black on the stage. And you hear uh, Brandy Carlisle's voice say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Dolly Parton. And everybody mm -hmm. just lost their crap. So if, <laughs> if they got the Dolly stamp of approval, I'm all in on the high women. I just think it's cool that they're still doing some of the similar things. It's a different take. It's a different feel. But right. yeah. uh, those ladies have put out some fantastic music. And I'm hopeful that there will be another project from them yeah. as well. So. This is an unfair comparison. Okay. But to me, it was like when it's a little like ghostbusters versus the ghostbusters women uh movie um and and i don't mean any disrespect to the high women um but when you go from you know uh dan Aykroyd and bill murray you know it, it, that's tough yeah tough to match uh, Not quite then, as steep right. of a quality drop off, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> but and then and, and all of those are incredibly talented performers, uh, male, female, whatever it doesn't matter. They're incredibly talented. But again, you're pulling your name off of Cash, Nelson, Jennings, and Christopherson. Big shoes to that, fill. That's that. tough. Right. That's tough. Right. Uh, but. You know, if they just kind of done their own thing and not brought that into it, hey, that's you know, awesome, great. Go I was gonna say, if it was, if it was like uh, Dolly Parton, Reba, and the Judge got together and <laughs> called themselves <laughs> the High Women, then you know, okay, yeah. there's there's some hit making credential, a long history of it, right? Kind of like these guys. There's there's more of a, maybe an equal comparison, but yeah. at the same time, I respect what they're doing. And yep. yeah, I think you're, they're absolutely great songwriters in their own right. Right. But, Phenomenally talented. Yeah, also, also get, also get what you're saying, Kevin. That's that's a hard thing to kind of, you know, bust on the scene and compare yourself to, right? Absolute legends. And it's this has nothing to do with feminism, male, female, anything like that. It I didn't oh, I wouldn't no. care if it was like. I don't know some of the some of the modern country guys coming out and trying to call themselves the Highwaymen part whatever. It's like the new Highwaymen. No, right? Sit down. No, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sit down. You're not. Do your own so, thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, great, uh, great stuff. Uh, if if you have if you're not familiar with the Highwaymen, uh, I hope that you will. Uh, take an opportunity to give this a listen we will have playlists on the the comments uh, pages of on our youtube channel and on facebook so it'll be very easy for you to access uh as much of the high women as you want to uh, so please do that and hope you've enjoyed this conversation about it but before we take off uh ben you want to tell us about something else going on with barkhart Bark art. Well, we've already mentioned Monday sucks and you're going to get to check mm -hmm. that show out with us. So be sure to check them out. You can find them live on Instagram on Monday nights. Um, Distillers talk is another fantastic show. Mm -hmm. 
if you really want to get super nerdy and you want to dig in on all things distilling, Alan Bishop, uh, the head distiller of Spirits of French Lick, and Christy Atkinson partner up, and they bring in various people from home distillers to other people distilling across the country that may be doing some things you might not be familiar with, and then some that you may very well be familiar with, such as uh, the barrel whiskey we sampled tonight. Uh, they had some of the people on from there, but they're going to really dig in. They also have a lot of fun. You're going to have a lot of laughs, but you're going to really get into some uh, subject matter that's absolutely fascinating from the distilling standpoint. So you're going to find them on, I think just about everywhere you can catch a podcast. Uh, usually there's a weekly release of that um, on distillers talk, and you can also find them on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, there you go. Great stuff. They are, uh, it's a fantastic show. They do a wonderful job. Always find myself uh, learning something and then having about a dozen questions that Very I want to ask myself. <laughs> So, Drew, what's coming up next for us? Yeah, yep. you can tune in next week. Uh, we're going to be doing our 10th episode. So we're going to be talking about the top 10 songs from 10 years ago. It is quite the list. Uh, and we're also going to be discussing some of our favorite 10-year-old uh, uh, bourbons, uh, maybe some other spirits as well. I'm not sure what's on the agenda for that. But uh, it's sure to be a great show, and uh, it's a, the first of some milestones for us. So pretty excited for that yeah. uh, coming up next week. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, it'll be interesting conversation anyway, based upon the uh, list of songs in that top ten. But uh, again, thank you, uh, for, <laughs> thank you for tuning in uh, today. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ben and Drew and myself, we greatly appreciate that. And would like you to uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, like and follow us on Facebook and other social media as well. And until next time, cheers, love, and free bird. Good night. Mm -hmm.